So, first lesson in this series is going to be about setting that first impression. Really, um, I'm not I'm not working on the camera. I want to talk to the people in the room. Um, the the real thing that you're looking at here is setting that first impression, setting something that's going to stick and it's going to be with them whenever they think of whatever your profession is, whatever you have to offer. You're the first person that's going to come to their mind. Uh, this can have applications in job interviews. This can have applications in networking and marketing, all kinds of places. And the real thing to think about is what kind of impression are you setting on somebody the first time that you meet them? So the first thing I kind of want to go into is what is the real first impression? Um, what a lot of people are under the interpretation of is when I walk up to you, EJ, for the first time and I introduce myself, that's my first impression with you, right? No, wait. I mean, like, if this is my first time meeting you, right? Well, yeah, but it's my first, you come first impression, right? For the most part. Okay. I'm, I'm, I hear what you're getting at, and you're exactly right. So the first impression doesn't just start when you introduce yourself to somebody. It doesn't start based off of your initial interaction with somebody. Your first impression of somebody is based off of the, the physical right when they walk in the room. Now, in some situations, this can actually be a little bit more intense because you're talking about in job applications and places where you're doing interviews, your first impression may have already been made for you. The internet can do that for you very easily. Um, somebody can get on your social media or other places if you don't have things obviously locked down to the level of privacy that is fitting for somebody searching for a job. Um, and they can see all kinds of stuff and form an opinion about you before you ever get the chance to really set your first impression. So that's the reason why I teach this first. The key is to avoid putting yourself on a, on a playing ground where you're not going to be level, you're not going to be even, because you've already got given yourself a disadvantage. Um, so mind, mind what your first impression is already saying from your social media, your websites, your out speaking um, in other areas. It's very easy to find. The internet is a fantastic thing. Um, now, that being said, as far as the physical side of things go, especially when it comes to relationships and um, the, the dating scene, for example, there's a lot of nonverbal communication that happens the very second that you walk into a room. Um, somebody's not forming an opinion about you based off of what you came up and said to them after you had three beers. They're, they're forming that opinion on you from the entire time that you were in there, from the second that you met your buddies and they were dogging on you the whole time and giving you, giving you guff and you know, you just kind of were sitting there taking it, they're, they're already forming an opinion about you. So when you go up to talk to that cute girl that you wanted to say hi to in the bar, she's already, you're off her radar. She's already seen you kind of take your, your gut from your friends, and she's like, ah, he's not really the alpha dog type, so I'm not, you know. That's, that's something you can run into, so be very aware of what your first impression is saying about you in the physical sense as well. So remember that it always starts from the second you walk in. Now, that being said, I'd actually like to skip down a little bit. Instead of going into the networking side of things right now, let's take a look at the body language and mental cues. For me personally, when I'm getting ready to go into a networking event, a job event, a sales interaction, anything where I'm about to make a first impression on somebody, I give myself various mental cues and physical cues. Um, and it all stems from essentially the floor up. So what I do is I align my pelvis, get things properly set up so that my back is in alignment. You don't want to walk into a room with your chest pumped out like this and looking like a dork when you yeah. want to talk to somebody. But you absolutely want to have your shoulders back and down, stay in a comfortable position where you have an open air around you. You're not condensing yourself to take up less room when you're communicating with somebody. You're taking up exactly enough room. You've got yourself comfortable and you look like you're laid back. People are going to communicate with you much more effectively and their first impression of you is going to be much better if they see you coming into an interaction completely comfortable. Um, if you are uncomfortable in an interaction, and that anybody who's in the sales field will tell you this, and your customer can see that you're in an uncomfortable interaction, they're gonna use that against you the second they get a chance. They will either use it to leverage themselves a better deal, or worse yet, they're not gonna trust you. They're gonna think that you're not an expert in what you're talking about because you're not comfortable, you're not confident, you don't have that air of the first impression you should be setting. Now, as far as body language and mental cues go, the other side of it, of course, is that, that mental breakdown of things and kind of getting to the point where you're ready for an interaction. So I always remind myself, whenever I go into a networking event, whenever I go into anything uh, where I'm meeting somebody new, I stop for a second, I remind myself, you're just another person in a room full of people. Don't think too much of it. If you fudge up and you don't set that great first impression, 
here's the thing, that person's not going to remember you. It's not going to matter. You are a blip in their life. You, you never even existed. Unless you set that golden impression that, that where they think about you every time. Um, the other thing to think about when you're, when you're talking about mental cues is just kind of getting yourself settled down and bringing yourself confidence back in. So when you're walking into an interaction, the biggest thing to realize is if you're if you're coming to somebody with information that you already know, you're the expert. So you're on it. Um, otherwise, when you're walking into other interactions, you always want to make sure that you come across as confident without coming across as cocky, arrogant, overconfident. Your body language says a lot about you, especially when you start getting into a conversation. Have you ever have you ever been in a conversation with somebody and they're at a table with you? like this, and they go to make a point, right? This is a really big thing with type A personalities. So they're making a point with you, and all of a sudden they're accentuating the point by going like this, right? What's your first reaction when you see that? Exactly. So now for another type A personality, that's not going to bother another type A personality. However, you have all kinds of different personality types and different people types in the world, and that may come across as very abrasive to somebody the first time. Especially if you're networking with other introverts and people who do not typically speaking get into that sort of situation, they're going to come, they're going to come across as threatening, and they're not going to want to communicate with you effectively. They're going to want to break that tie as soon as possible. That's going to be the guy who goes, "I got to go to the bathroom." He's going to run away, and you're not going to see him again at that social event. So keep that in mind. So networking versus making friends. This is a huge, huge problem in the field of communications and relationships. We spend a lot of times nowadays with our face in our phones and our heads in our banks and nowhere else. We're not spending enough time really interacting with the people around us and building the relationships that we need to be building in order to have a true, effective business relationship with somebody. So I was just speaking with you about this, but essentially, when people go to networking events, particularly for business, the first thing that they're doing is they're turning on that magical station. It's WIIFM, what's in it for me, right? That's a very famous quote from Zig Ziglar. And he's talking about the fact that everybody listens to that station. What you've got to portray instead of that is not necessarily what's in it for me, but what can I do for you? What can I be for you? What can I connect you with? What kind of doors could I open for you? And that's the way that you really want to set that first impression because if you come across as somebody who, you know, you're not even in somebody's league and you're like coming up to them to ask them something, they're, they're going to shrug you off. However, if you go to somebody that's on your level and you say, hey, what do you do? What, what is your profession? For, for example, what's, what's your profession? What do you do? Um, IT. Okay. So, so if I came up to you as somebody who had absolutely no connections in the IT yeah. field, and it was obvious that I was coming to you with the sole intent and purpose of trying to solicit your services either at a lower rate or try to sell something to you with little to no knowledge of who you are, yeah, you're going to shut that right down because you already have dealt with that before. The age of the pushy used car salesman is over. That whole age is over and nobody can get away with it anymore because everybody's seen the tactics, they've seen it at work, and they know what it feels like. We've all been to a used car dealership. We've all been to a furniture store. We've all been to an electronics store where you get this guy coming up next to you cracking jokes and slapping you on the back and telling you, hey, you should buy this thing. That's a first impression now. It's not necessarily like a thing that you learn about them afterward. You can feel one of those salespeople coming from like 100 feet away. You can just see the electricity crackling around them as they run towards you. And that's not the precedent you want to set. Um, so the networking side of things. The networking will come with the relationships. The networking will come with the friendships. If you build true friendships with those around you and build real relationships, what you should be aiming to do is that person that you just met, that, met at that event, don't make your first interaction with them after the event. Business, 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 business. Instead, go to them and say, hey, what are you up to today? How's your family? Would you like to meet for coffee? Don't bring up the business stuff. Just kind of network and let it go. And you're going to find that when you set that first impression with them of uh, this is what this guy's about. He's friendly. He's charming. He doesn't want to necessarily sell me stuff. He's not on top of me all the time, but he still checks in. It's that fondness that grows from you just checking in every now and again, extending a hand and saying, hey, this is, I'm just hanging around. Hi. So when you are setting that first impression, make sure 
that you're not going to it with the attitude of this is what I want from you. And this does apply in uh, places where you're doing interviews and places where you're doing like just basic sales interactions. This applies in normal everyday life. Um, you don't want to go to the gas station clerk with the old, you know, a slap and tickle about, you know, give you a discount on this, that, or the other thing. You don't want to go to it like that. You want to talk to this person, get with them, and, you know, one of those days, you know what, they're going to hand you a free coffee. It's not me today. Go ahead. And that's when you know you have a real friend is yeah. there willing to reach out to you with stuff like that. Um, and as far as job interviews go, that's the same thing. So job interviews have very much changed over the last, you know, 15, 20 years. It's not necessarily as, as it was where you got to go in in a suit, you got to like just be stick straight and all that kind of stuff. It's not about that anymore. What people want to see now is they want to see personal skills yeah. because they're so rare. They're hard to find. And the reason for that is because we all got our faces stuffed in the screen 24-7. We're not interacting with people. We're not putting ourselves in those uncomfortable situations. And you can tell when you're doing an interview with somebody who has no social skills, who has not pulled their face out of their phone long enough to really get some, some first impression skills. You can tell when you get a guy, not necessarily dogging on suits. I, I know it's a good thing. But when you get a guy who's standing stick straight, who's all suited up and everything, it's not going to matter a dime in the world if he's got a face like Ben Affleck. It doesn't matter if he's not communicating effectively with you, if he doesn't set a good first impression with you. If the second you shake his hand, you don't feel the connection right there, it's not going to work. And the, there's a lot to say about that, and it's a very good topic to get into, just in the fact of communication being so important in almost everything that you do. It doesn't matter what you pick up, that communication is going to be key. All right, so let's get back on topic here. I know I got a little off. Eye contact, huge, gigantic, massive thing. Now, I've already kind of explained to some of you, I'm not coming to this with an angle of somebody who has done schooling in social skills, social sciences, psychology, anything like that. The angle that I'm approaching this from is the kid who sat on his computer and played World of Warcraft for 22 years. That was me. That really? was me. I would Absolutely. have never guessed that. So the reason why this transformation happened, I spent 22 years being unhappy. Yeah. I didn't like where I was going with my life. Things were not the way I wanted them to be. And I knew that I had zero communication skills. So all I was really good for was being a factory guy. That was it. That's, I mean, you don't need to have great communication skills to walk into a factory and have the foreman grunt at you and then you're good to go. Like, yeah, there's not, a, there's not a lot to that. So one of the things that I struggled the most with coming out of that introversion cell was eye contact. Eye contact was a huge thing that I struggled with. And part of it came from social anxiety. Sometimes it can come from, um, there, there's a lot of psychology behind this and I don't want to get into a territory that I'm not certified in or an expert in. But I will say from experience that social anxiety can cause massive issues when it comes to eye contact with people and how you feel in a room and what you feel about the people around you. Like you always feel like somebody's talking down to you 24 seven. And when you feel that way, you're not gonna keep eye contact with people. Um, when I first got into the sales field, that was my biggest struggle. I couldn't keep eye contact. And that lost me sale after sale after sale because they thought that I was dishonest. So that's a huge thing with the eye contact, making sure that people can see your eyes, see exactly what you're thinking in your eyes, um, not necessarily have a, I, I wouldn't say have like just a stoic look on your face, but be friendly. Let your eyes show that internally you're very kind. And that will take you a very long way. Your eye communication is everything. And that ties right into the nonverbal side of that first impression. Because what I will tell you from experience is, I would say 50% of the time I can tell what somebody's going to be like when they walk into my gym just based off their eyes, like what their eyes tell me, not even counting like the micro expressions on their face, not counting any of the body language that they're feeding me, just their eyes. So that's a huge thing. Make sure you have eye contact when you're, when you're first setting an impression. Make sure that, that person can see your eyes and that they are keeping eye contact with you. Um, that will also make you a more effective communicator in your first impression. When you are getting with somebody for the first time, that eye contact is going to show them, hey, I'm listening to you. Um, you're listening to me. We're having a conversation with each other. Like, this is an interaction that both of us are taking apart. I know it sounds silly and breaks down to something simple, but just that one change when you are an introverted person and don't understand eye contact can make a huge difference. 
Okay, so asking the unorthodox questions. This is one of my favorite things about being in sales and being in the relationships department. I, I so dig asking completely unorthodox questions. Like, they come across sometimes as like way, way, way beyond my scope. You'd be surprised though how many people I talk to all the time where I ask them a pretty personal question. Like, where'd you go on your honeymoon? What'd you do there? And people are happy as day to just go on for an hour about what they did in Cancun. People don't realize that you don't have to just ask like simple, straight, safe questions at all times. You're going to be remembered if you were the person that asked them some totally off the wall question that they're not used to. I don't mean ask them something offensive, like like don't ask them. What's that? Sorry, I can hear. What is this? I'm teaching a, a communications class. If you want, you're welcome to join. Okay. The, uh, just so you have the heads up, the lesson today is on first impressions and how to set one that is, that was probably a horrible one. <laughs> it's okay, you didn't know it. See, mental and verbal cues, had he had the knowledge that he was going to walk into this, I bet he would have been able to give himself the body language and mental cues coming to an entirely different personality. We were just talking about that, so the way that you the way that you walk into a room, the way you cue yourself beforehand will prepare you for that initial first impression. Okay. So the unorthodox questions thing, you, like I said, would be astounded at the questions that you can ask people and get away with it. It's amazing. Like, I'm not talking about offensive stuff. Don't ask people what's in their top drawer or their nightstand. That's a silly question. <laughs> Don't do that. However, if you see a ring in your hand, ask them what their wife's name is. Ask them, you know, how, do they have kids? How old are they? Where do your kids go to school? Like, obviously don't say like, hey, where do your kids go to school? Because that's going to come across the street. But if you build a reputation with them enough with that initial interaction, they're going to be comfortable telling you about stuff like that. And people love to talk about the things that are most important to them, especially like their kids, their family, um, what their, their big truck that they just bought. People love bragging about stuff like that. You know, you see a guy's set of keys as you're starting to interact with him, he's got like a brand new Corvette logo on his keys. Ask that dude about his car. Who's going to tell you about it in the next 30 minutes? He's not going to shut up about it. You're exactly right, and that's going to be, when he's thinking about all the people that he networked with at this event, he's going to go, man, that dude asked me about my car, like, that's really cool, I got to like tell this guy about a whole bunch of cool stuff. That's the impression that's going to stick. It's not going to be the guy who came up to him and was like, hey man, I got a couple million dollars in funds and I've been looking around and just kind of see it, like, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's, that's not going to go as well as that very personal connection that you just had, because you just made his day, you get to brag to you about something stupid. That's... That's exactly what you should be aiming for. So ask the unorthodox questions. Ask silly stuff. Use your observation skills when you first meet somebody to help you make that sticking first impression, that thing that's really going to stay in the back of their mind. Okay, so we'll get into this one here just briefly. I don't like going too far into detail on this, but what your attire is telling someone. Now, you're seeing this mostly from the angle of like t-shirt and jeans versus suit. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about in attire is not just limited to your clothing. It's limited to how many accessories you're wearing. Is it overkill? Is it gaudy? Do you seem like the kind of person that's way overdoing it? Um, for Obviously, for the ladies that wear makeup, sometimes the makeup is a little bit excessive. And when you're in a, in a networking event and you're just trying to make friends, believe it or not, that can actually turn people off because they think that you're trying too hard um, and that's that's not to say you know that makeup is a bad thing. It's awesome. Do your thing. Like wear makeup if you're going to wear makeup. But don't let it get to a point where you're trying to mask your personality with the makeup. Like once you get to a certain point, your attire starts to overwhelm what your words and your personality are saying. And that can go the other way too. So that's why you don't go to big social events and just show up in like a, a ratty tank top and like. <laughs> cut off jean shorts. It's the same reason, because if you show up like that, you're probably not going to get invited with a bunch of people to go network together. You're like, uh, stand out. Totally yeah, well, yeah, I mean, of course you're going to stand out like a sore thumb all day long, but um, you're going to be memorable, but not in the right way, not the way we're looking for it. So, well, not if it's an agricultural show. What's that? <laughs> not if it's an agricultural show. show. That's fair. If it's an agricultural show, you can wear whatever you like. Show, show and just get tired. Yeah. <laughs> Throw them all off. Okay, so now that I've kind of gone into the basics of setting a first impression, I want to hear from you guys. When, 
when you first started getting into your field, when you first started getting into the thing that you're working on now, whether it's a project, whether it's a career, a business, whether it's being a parent, there's all kinds of stuff. What was your biggest struggle when it came to a first impression? Did you ever have a bad experience getting the first impression on someone? Okay. What would you say was your worst mistake? Like, if you had a bad impression on someone, who would you have a bad impression on, and what did you do to cause that bad impression? Uh, no, it's, it, there's a lot of them already. Okay. Uh, Throw me a memorable one. Oh, this is my first semester in college. Okay. I did not like my, prof my government professor at all. His first impression of him was, I didn't, he, he, was, he was a very grumpy old man with okay. mentality. You know, came in wearing a Ohio suit, oh, oh, he decked in like, a sweater vest. It, this guy was at least 60 plus. So I'm like, but he, he buddy heads. I don't, I don't know how to explain it, but I'm pretty sure I did not make a good impression on him. It's a discussion class, but then, you know, I'm, I don't know, it's just, it was ugly. I can't really, it, ah! <laughs> so essentially, what you're telling it, me. It did not go very well with that class, it was not fun at all. Okay. I mean, it was a struggle just to get through it. So you bring up a really good point there and a really good piece of this puzzle, and that's that your first impression of somebody is going to be very, very hard to erase, especially if it's a bad one. Yeah. If it's a very bad impression and you guys just straight up butted heads right off the bat and you're completely abrasive with each other's personalities, that's going to set the kind of first impression that you don't want, but it's also going to be very difficult to undo any damage from that first impression. So. What I would say is, had this been not a teacher, but had this yeah. been a coworker, or had this been a peer of yours, or someone who eventually down the road you could have networked with and made partners with, yeah. the most effective thing to do would have been to kind of turn that around somehow. And the easiest way to do that is just to get them talk about themselves. Yes, teachers are a little bit different because they're limited in what they can and can't talk about, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. However, if you find that thing, and typically speaking, if you're with a teacher, you'll find it because they'll just kind of slip it into conversation here and there. Did he have like one thing that he was just oh, like, he would slip in uh, repeatedly? Uh, Ohio State? No, well, hopefully not. Ohio State. said one there, but that's not, no, he would complain constantly. This is the old man that would complain about like city ordinances. So he, he went off, he would go off on tangents in his in the government class. Okay. Was, well, I guess they would consider their ordinances, but he complained one time about how his neighbor, so his neighbor, you know, on RV, right? So apparently where he lives in Rockford, you're not allowed to park it on your driveway. I don't get that. Okay. Like you own the land, but apparently you're not allowed to park it there. So someone complained the city because it reduces their house worth. And I'm just like, why is this a tax issue? Why is this a code, you know? Like, yeah. he, he's the kind of neighbor that will bitch at you if you don't take it off in like the first week because he had a guy who goes RV, obviously the family. And he can, apparently he said he brought up to one time, I don't want to see that on the car. That's his property, you can't tell him, oh, I can tell him that. Dude, that, like, dude, that wasn't a good impression for him or that guy. That's, that's definitely not the way he was So he's guy. obviously not a very friendly neighbor. He also would complain about chickens and broccoli. He approach problems pretty well. So if I asked her, hey, is this, did I do something wrong? Like, did something oh, happen? Was that? Yeah, exactly. Like those strange dreams. Like, that's exactly. Like, I, would, I would just say, can I make them comfortable that I do something that's not jiving with you? Please tell me. I'd like to make sure that I'm not setting a bad impression. Yeah. That right there, just the ability to recognize that you are setting a bad impression and turn it around halfway through, can usually say, as long as it's not something intense, like apparently the hate for an ex-boyfriend. That's that's a that's a problem. You're probably not going to get around. So my of course my approach to that was marry them to another staff member. Like that's that's something you have to do. So, so BJ, oh yeah, go ahead. You have a question? Yeah, I have a question. So Tyler, there is another school of thought that says pretty much you cannot really please everyone. There are going to be some people that you just cannot please. Yeah. And it will be more along the lines of what's your target audience? And then attacking from data of like, I'm trying to, let's say, network with this uh, people that have this interest and so on and so forth. Mold yourself around that area and then attack there. Yeah. Uh, what's, I just wonder, like, what's your thought, what are your thoughts on that kind of philosophy? Uh, my thoughts on that, kind of, if I understand your question correctly, my thoughts on that are twofold. 
I believe that when you go into an interaction, you should be confident in who you are and not change the, necessarily the way that you approach a situation just based off of what you're after. Um, when you want, especially like a networking situation, a, a first impression situation, here's what I don't want. I don't want to set a first impression where I go to somebody and tell them everything that they want to hear, and then next week they realize I have nothing to do with any of the things they were talking about. I'm just kind of faking it, right? So if, I, if, I, if I'm getting your question right, that's, that's my opinion, is that if you believe in yourself, if you believe in the way that you approach a situation, if you have built the skills to have a proper dialogue with somebody and have the confidence of the conversation to go in a way where it's not going to be offensive, it's not going to cause problems, that shouldn't be an issue. You shouldn't run into that. But be careful walking into a situation not necessarily looking at it from a different lens because looking through a different lens is absolutely fine. I way, way, way support the idea of looking at a problem through multiple lenses and attacking it through which one's best. But when you're first setting an impression with somebody, the last thing that you want to do is come across as fake. Even if you're really, really good at faking it, at some point they're going to realize that that's not you. And that's going to bring questions to their mind. And then you're playing a gambling game of, have I gotten to know this person well enough yet that once they find this out about me, that they're going to accept it? And you don't want to play that game. It's a dangerous game, especially when you have a job or right? Yeah, let me, let me explain so that it is a little bit more. Because I, I probably didn't do a very good job of explaining yeah. the, uh, the, what I meant by that. For example, let's suppose that you are trying to make friends, you know, and, you know, like people that share your values or your interests. Let's say you want to go well with those people. The way that you're trying to make friends is going to be totally different than the way that you will try to get business partners. Okay. Because the skills that are going to be required are going to be totally different. Okay. One is going to require you to be outgoing, to share your thoughts, your values, and all that stuff. Another one is going to require you to be reserved in certain areas and keep your private life separate from your Correct. Yeah. Life. So some people go, what I mean more, what I actually meant is, some people believe in the school of thought of, let's say for example, you're trying to get business partners. You're not going to deal well with all, all people. There are going to be some people that are going to enjoy a lot more like free time and things like that. There are going to be a lot of people that are more, okay, let's go down to business. Let's do what we need to do. Some people believe more in what, where exactly do I need to go, or where do we want to go, and then from that, go, going more like all being kind of framing, let me put it this way, framing the conversation or framing your interaction based on your goal. So okay. there's a school of thought that goes more like that, where, of course, the way that you interact with your friends is going to be different than the way that you interact in business. Right. But it's more like they're saying it more like from the point of view of trying to frame your interaction. Instead of trying to please everyone, more like framing your interaction on what your goal is. Yeah, that I agree with. Um, if you're not faking who you are, if you're not faking what you're interested in, it is very easy to dial in that area that you're searching for to frame that first impression. I absolutely believe that. If you set the first impression with somebody of, I'm very business-like, I'm friendly, I'm happy to see you, and I'm going to set a good impression with you, but I'm also very business-oriented, and I want to get stuff done, that will, you'll easily translate that as long as you understand the basics of what you are going into it for, the reason why you're networking in the first place. I feel that as long as you have a good understanding of why you're networking and you understand why you're making friends, even if you're approaching a crummy business angle where you're surely trying to get some done with it, I agree. There are multiple different sort of angles to look at it from, and whatever angle you work best from is how you should be trying to set your first impression. Um, you shouldn't necessarily, even if the crowd of people doing it this way is this big and your chances are better of getting something going with that group, you should still go for that smaller group that does things your way. Because you're going to jive much better. Your first impression is going to be very easy to set. You're going to be on an even playing ground right off the bat with them. And I think that will actually help a lot with the first impression. So yeah, I, I totally feel you there. Like that is exactly what, like I'm with that school of thought. Absolutely. Uh, I think as long as you're not 
they something that's completely okay to sort of narrow down how many friends you're trying to make. Now, me personally, when I go to a networking event, I can be a little bit nuts with it because I go everywhere. I try to talk to everyone. I try to get in everyone's ear and try to sort of learn a little bit about everybody in the room. I find that doing that in advance kind of tells me which people in the room are going to be good options for me to try to build rapport with efficiently. Um, I do believe you can build rapport and you can build a relationship with somebody in a slow way. Or if you guys have abrasive personalities, there is a point at which you will be able to get around those abrasive personalities and you just have to work at it together. Yeah. However, if you kind of look around the room and you've already met a bunch of the people and you sort of know who you're going to jive with, then afterwards you can sort of get with those people and very efficient and network, very efficient and make friends and connections. And those are the ones that are going to be easy to keep too. You're not going to have to put quite as much maintenance work into those interactions as you would putting maintenance work into um, the, the harder to generate interactions. Yeah. What's your question? No, I have no question anymore. I got it. So, I have a question. <laughs> the last time that somebody said a bad first impression, who was it? What did you do? Um, Forgive me, I don't have any smaller water containers. I'm a gallon guy. We have cups if you want. <laughs> it's too late now, man. It already happened. It's on stream. My ex boyfriend's friend came to the house looking for him. Okay. He knocked on the door. And um, he, they used to work together at this place in Comstock Park called Chipcrete. They would always wear like respirators and things. They made concrete. I didn't recognize him without like all his gear on. And he came to the door and he was like, hey, where's Billy? And I was like, oh, you know, Billy's not here, yada, yada. And he was like, well, where is he at? Joking with me. I'd like only ever set eyes on this guy like twice in my whole life. And I, I had no idea who he was. And he was just like, just looked like he was up to no good, I guess. And I was just kind of like, I don't know. And I just yeah. closed the door. So he sort of made, I guess it wasn't like a first impression, but it was like I was meeting a whole new person. <laughs> and then I made a really bad impression on him too, because I was just like, oh, no, you don't talk to me like that. <laughs> That's a good point to make too. This is actually something to keep in mind. When you're making your first impression, be careful how much of that first impression you made and how much relationship building you've done afterwards. Because no matter how good that first impression that you set was, if you turn around and set your next impression as a very bad one, they're going to keep the job right off it. It's going to go bad. And that's that's a really natural kind of just way that we think. Um, our, I, in my opinion, our brains are kind of coded to judge behavior like that. Like, when we first meet someone, we're always kind of looking for that edge. We're looking for where somebody might have um, like some untrustworthy natures or anything like that. And exactly, you're going to know where to draw the line. And then in the second interaction with them, if all of a sudden you're seeing all these traits that weren't there before, or even if it's something silly, like what's in your case, where it just happened to be that like, you changed into a mask, and it essentially evoked a fear response to you. Probably before you even actually like were talking to the guy, the very second that you saw him, you had a fear response, you had a bad first impression. And what a smart, like not smart, but communication savvy person would have done is pull the mask off and then just stay on neutral at the door and obviously remain neutral the whole time. So they didn't correct me. No, he was wearing every time the two times I saw him before he had been wearing a mask. When he came to my house, he was like all cleaned up and just okay. had no idea who he was. <laughs> and I was just like yeah. I don't know you, you can't talk to me like that. Okay. Which is funny because regularly I'm one of those people that like can, like if I don't if I like somebody I kinda of pick on them. If I don't like somebody I just kind of ignore them. And so really like my mind is pretty low for like a tolerance. And this guy just came up at one time and I was like, nope, done. Yes, yep. <laughs> and that is that's also a really good point. Um, and I, I didn't even think of this. This is awesome. I brought that up. So remember when you're making your first impression with somebody, there are behavior thresholds that each person has. Every person that you meet and network with and set your first impression with is going to have certain thresholds where if you exceed those thresholds with your behaviors, you're going to end up getting abrasive with it. 
So um, sometimes, and believe it or not, I've had this happen with people being upset because I was too over the top excited. Um, I, I tend to be a very high energy person. Um, not this, I don't do high pressure sales. I do high energy sales. I love enthusiastic. Exactly. Yes. You bust on the door. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, it's this, this is a thing where I was too excited for this guy. He's like in his mid 70s. He's, he's in his mid 70s. Uh, had a few of those Navy hats on. Like, you know, I, I approached the situation wrong because of my inexperience. And I set the impression of being way, way over this guy's happy threshold. <laughs> like, his happy threshold was about right here. His happy threshold died after you. I, I don't know what happened, but this guy's happy threshold was right here, and I'm way up here for the happiness. So obviously that's too much. You're coming at it too heavy. And that's another thing to keep in mind, like I said, is watch those thresholds. Watch out for when you start getting near on. The funny thing is you can spot when you're getting close to one of those thresholds because their facial expression will give it away. Their facial expression, the way they look at you, or their body language, one of the three, or all of the three, will change as you start to run into one of those thresholds. So if you see somebody's body language go from something like this, where they're standing and talking to you, to all of a sudden standing like this, you know that you've caused an issue. You know that you've caused an offense. And that's something where you can sort of dial it back and kind of hit it from a different angle. Like you can notice that they're surly and you know they're real stoic. And they'll obviously they don't, they don't want to have some happy puppy dog come run up to them and cause all kinds of problems. You want to go to them with the attitude of being very professional, very stoic, very quiet, and just make sure that you're solid and clear and understood. And this is something that you learn in communications, especially in sales. The, the best way to communicate, in my opinion, to get somebody to understand where you're coming from and understand where you're at is to get them to your level. So what I call it is hanging on the road. So what I'll do is, it's kind of like the karate kid. I'll mirror my client when they first come in. I'll stay at the same energy level they're at. Then what I'll do is once I match their energy, I match their flow in the way that they're kind of dealing with conversation, slowly, 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 I bump up the intensity, I bump up the energy, bump up the excited level, and obviously, like I said, cross thresholds. However, most people have a happy threshold that's like way up here. It's very rare that you're going to run into somebody who doesn't. So being able to pull somebody up with you with the rope to kind of get to that level, that's also going to help you set a better impression because everybody else that talked to that person at that social event, at that job interview, whatever it happened to be, everybody else that talked to that person, if they approached them in the, in the sense of like, this is a level of conversation, I'm going to stay at your exact level, and I'm not going to go any higher than your level because I'm not confident in myself or scared of whether you're going to judge me or blah, 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 that's not going to set as good of a first impression as somebody who is able to go to their level and then pull them up to a happy because that's going to be the spike of the highlight of their night right there is the fact that they, they felt like when they were talking to you, well, I was way happier than everybody else was talking to you. It just kind of felt like it was a thing. So, yeah, that's, that's another really good point. That's, thank you for bringing that up. That's a huge thing. So, last time that you made a bad impression, so we're not counting the, the guy in the mask. Think back to the last time that you are sure you made a bad impression on somebody. Who was it? How'd you make it? Um, we went to a baby shower and I don't remember exactly what I said, but I made a dirty joke to a mutual, to a, to a friend that was also there. Um, and she said something, and it was like one of those, like, that's what she said kind of situations. It was like, she said something, I made a pun, and the person that we were there, like, her baby shower was just kind of like, she's so trashy. Okay. So I have a couple of questions for you. How much did you know about this person before you went to that? Um, I knew enough that I wouldn't make the joke directly to her. You knew you were kind of flying in the danger zone. Yes, okay. I did. Okay. So. But it was also like, but I, it was like a knee-jerk reaction. Right. Because the other girl that I knew, I just kind of buddied up with her, and I've known her since like middle school. Right. So it just, I, I wasn't in the right mind frame. There's there, I, there's a totally different mind frame I'd be in to hang out with that really conservative girl. And I sort of blurred the lines. Okay. So that's where we see an example of impression by association. That is somebody else dragging out that part of you that's not necessarily going to make the best impression <laughs> in the world. 
and you kind of caved in and just let it happen. Which I do get in trouble with that other girl a lot. <laughs> so the thing to remember with that is, are you concerned with having a future relationship with this person? Do you care if they're part of your life? That's the question. Now, personally, the way that I'm trying to approach relationships and approach um, my my thinking towards people, and it's like we're going to keep them all exactly. The way that I approach everybody around me, and obviously there's going to be people I got to cut, like that you know where your your step is, where you get a snippet. However, yeah. um, when you approach somebody, even if you've never met them in your life, you, they they could be the banker, the, you're driving the Lake Michigan Credit Union, talking to the guy at the counter. Act like that guy is going to be in your life for the rest of your life. Well, that will be keep going that way. <laughs> Got it. But that will completely change the way that you set your first impression because that right there is going to give you a giant mental cue. Hey, it's time to shape up. This person may be around forever. I need to make sure that I don't offend them. I need to make sure that I'm communicating effectively with them and setting an impression. It's really well, going to set an impression too because technically still a sales. Well, true, yeah, and, and I agree. Other here's, here's the problem, though. You can only control what you do. Yeah. I you can't control what that banker's gonna do. No, they're not a puppet. They're not a puppet. So. Right. Right. Hi. Are you taking off? Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you joined us for the part of this that you did, and thank you for your input too. Thanks. That question was awesome. Yeah. I'll see you guys later, bro. The next one. Have a great night. Okay. Yeah. Take care, everyone. So, so what you're saying pretty much is like, even if you're not going to go to that bank for the rest of your life, or for the rest of the week even, you still need to be able to like flex your muscles and practice those skills on like every Absolutely, week. yeah. There, it's just like any other muscle. Your, your emotional intelligence, your emotional IQ, is just like every other part of your body. It needs to be worked out, it needs to be maintained. Um, you're going to get rusty if you don't use those skills all the time. It's got to be, if you're somebody who is looking to network on a regular basis and build relationships quickly, the, the real thing to think about is you want to make sure that that's pulling to a razor edge. You're ready at any point in time to make a friend. That's me personally, when I look at the sales field, that is exactly what it is. How fast can I make a friend? How fast can I get on common ground with them? And how fast can I have a conversation with them? That's it. That's, that's all sales is. That's all relationship building is. As long as you break it down to the minimum of how fast can I make a friend? What can I do for this person? What is the, uh, okay, so you know I've been in the seven memberships for a while. So yeah. What is the fastest record of you getting a friend? Okay. My fa so you're asking me what my fastest sale was? <laughs> yes. Uh, my fastest sale was uh, a lady who came in I think it was four to five months ago. Okay. Um, we came in, or she came in, we talked for approximately five minutes. During that five minutes, um, we spoke briefly in regards to her trepidation of joining gyms. And within the first three minutes, we were talking about how she was scared she was gonna die because her doctor told her that she was pre-diabetic so and she had her daughter was upset and everything else. And oh, yeah. the, just listening, just asking what's wrong made the difference. Bad, yeah. Because I could see when she walked in, like she wasn't comfortable at yeah, all. I wouldn't be either. But she had a look on her face of like, I'm, I, I'm here. I kind of need I'm this. Doing this for yeah. A reason. And because of that, I knew to ask her, what's going on? Like, yeah. what's brought you in today? I can see that you're like shaking. So like, this is that's how you very quickly make a friend. Is I, you're, you're I just ask. Wait to her. I hate working out in public. I, I will work out if I get a four at home gym. I go. I hate working out public. I feel weird. It's just awkward. Unless everybody else around me is doing it. Like in high school, that wasn't a big issue. Yeah. yeah. Gym class, but uh, you won't. You won't ever catch a bitch. Awkward. Here's the thing with that, and and actually, I, I would love to bring. I don't think this is necessarily related to the lesson. However, yeah. I think that this could kind of give you a piece of uh, just a tool for your toolbox. Okay. okay. When I joined the gym when I started getting into the fitness field. Um, it was approximately three, four years ago. I was this height, but weighed 145 pounds, and was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. Yeah. In the morning, I would wake up and, you know those, those big <laughs> monster BFC cans? Yeah. Those were next to my bed. I would pick one up and crack it first thing in the morning, pound it, and then the rest of the day, eat junk food and smoke cigarettes, and um, just 
living in a generally unhealthy way. I didn't do anything that was physical for myself. I sat at the computer all day. I played RuneScape. Like, it was bad. Yeah. Like, this was a thing that I really did. And what happened was I woke up one morning and I felt awful. Like, I, I woke up and my lungs hurt, my chest hurt, my yeah. stomach hurt. Everything was feeling really bad. And even though I felt awful, the first thing that I did was walk over, grab a pack, put a cigarette out of my pack, and walk outside and start smoking it. Yeah. And it was at that moment that I went, no, i done. Not anymore. And so I got a gym membership. I started getting active and started getting into the fitness scene. Um, within three years, which obviously it's not a short-term transformation, it took a very long time, I went from 145 pounds to 215 pounds, and then dropped back down to 205 because I gained a little bit more weight than I wanted. I went on a seafood diet. Seafood, yeah. you eat it? Yeah. My diet. <laughs> yeah, I love that diet. <laughs> Here's the thing to remember. When I went into the gym, I got a gym membership at the meatheadiest gym in town. It's a bunch of meatheads lifting gigantic weights all the time. You say meathead like you're not meathead. I'm not a meathead. <laughs> I, was, I, was completely, I was completely blown away because these guys were like deadlifted 400 pounds like it was nothing. Just yeah, I, mine was 125 senior year in high school. Yeah, they're they're out they're out they're out doing it. Yeah, yeah, these are meatheads. I just watched <laughs> Moose um flip a brand new freezer that she got. Like it was a fucking domino. Moose is an animal. And I was like, I need to go work out. Dang it! I don't know it. if you've ever seen Moose's legs, but she is an animal. I was yeah. struggling. <laughs> I struggled to get the box that came in yeah. out to the dumpster, and she just that, flipped that, that, that freezer really end like, over end. My my other body is like I'm a scrawny limp who yeah. plays keyboard games. My body, like, I could, I could do over 300 pounds squatting. Yeah, like, yeah, see, my legs are always been bigger. Yeah. And, right. here's, here's the reality behind it. Understand a few things about being in the gym, and I think it would completely change your opinion. I'm, yes. How do you, like, handle people like that? That, that would be the one for me that you really freaking out. Know. Like, where you can tell that there's something that, yeah. that you're rubbing them the wrong way, but, it, but you can tell, you, you get that maybe it's not something you're doing. Honestly, office. I do the one thing that people are scared to do, and that's ask okay. why they're acting that way. Exactly. There are so many people who <laughs> don't have the communication skills to ask, why are you acting like this? Like, everybody sees it as like a taboo. When somebody's upset at you, you get so unsure of yourself. You see nothing wrong with it, like, right, right. Oh, crap, what did I do? Yeah, well, and the thing is, too, like, this society is so quick right now to the second that they face adversity or face a no from somebody to shoot you in the box and they run away because they're scared. And that's not how effective communications happen. If we allow people to continue communicating like this, it's only going to get worse. That's why you ask the unorthodox questions. Even if it seems like it's something that, you know, it's going to be awkward. Yeah, it would have been awkward if I had said to this girl, hey, what's going on? What did I do? But yes, yes, it would have been awkward as hell if she'd have been like, well, my ex cheated on me two weeks ago and you look just like him. I would have been like, oh, okay. There's literally nothing I can do about that. And I'm sorry for my ugly face, but <laughs> I really want to help you. That's what you're thinking. Yeah. No, no, like honestly, I would have said to her, I'm really sorry that I remind you of him. There's absolutely nothing I can do. It's literally the way my face is shaped. <laughs> And that's a problem. Yeah. However, please understand that I'm here because I want to help you to be a part of the gym and I want to help you get healthy and fit. Yeah. And I want to help you bounce back from what this a-hole did to you. So, and don't let my ugly face check you. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. You break the cycle. You break, you break the ice. Yes, exactly. You break the cycle on it. And I would have been, if I had had the exact same experience that I had now, I would have been able to recognize that that's what was going on and I would have asked that Yeah, question. well, that was the first time you witnessed you were back yeah. at that point. You are like, oh, gosh. So yeah, so that's that's how I would. How did my teachers teach your female coworker come back and tell you that? Is that how you found out? Yeah, well, it wasn't even that. I I was listed on oh, the wall. Yeah. So it's well, a classic. Thin, right? It's a classic sales thing. When when you're a sales manager, um, you kind of hang around the cubicle. It's called bull training. You yeah. just sort of hang around and like do one of these maneuvers and wait for something to go wrong. Yeah. Because at the end of the day. Yes, your relationship building is important, but yeah. you also need to make the business side of things work. 
So, like, for example, if somebody's going to lose a sale and something silly, like it's just a mistake they made or something, yeah. you got to be ready to jump in. Also, it's a learning procedure, too, because if that person did something that changed that person's mind, yeah. you absolutely should be listening to what that was. So that's that's why, like, I practice vulturing heavily. I'll just hang out outside the cubicle and sort of wait and see, like, what happens and what their relationships are, that kind of thing. And I think there's a lot of value to that. But that's that's how I found out about it. I was listening to her talk to her about it. Yeah. And I'm like, and of course they're gonna relate to you. Exactly. And I'm just sitting there like an idiot. I'm like, okay. Well, that's that's not that. Yeah. That's so anyway, um, last one, BJ. Yes. When was the last time that somebody made a bad impression on you? That's hard because I don't like people very much anyway. Please tell me that's not me. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good thing. No, no, I, I did this. Let's let's kind of break into this a little more. I want to understand from your angle why don't you like people in general? Like, what is your thought process behind? I just don't like people. It's a pain in the ass to interact with them. Okay. Too much effort. Okay. <laughs> more effort than I feel it's worth. So, <laughs> your your problem comes in where you're trying to manage what they're doing, probably right? Like that's. Yeah. <laughs> like trying to direct them to do things is harder than necessary, so you'd rather just do it yourself. No, just interacting. You just All the formalities required for proper social interaction. Okay, so you're just kind it of... It seems silly. It's, it's, the, it's the actual, I guess, like process that it takes to learn and build those skills. Yeah, it's well, probably, I, I, I don't have a problem with interacting with people, I just right. don't prefer it. Okay, okay, I but get I it. know I, I don't have it. a problem. So, here's a little side question for you. What, if anything would be the golden ticket for you to make you want to interact with more people? This is a hard question to answer, so think about it for a second. If you can't answer it now, that's fine. Just get back to me with it. But think about that. What would be the golden thing, the golden ticket, that would just make it so that you would start talking to everybody around you? Well, it would have to be shared common interests to a certain degree of enthusiasm. Okay. So being in a room full of like-minded people is kind of your, that's your, your key to open the door, yeah. correct? I don't want it to be like bubbly or it's no outside ideas are prevented from entering. So it's just kind of like a, a good way to put it would be circle jerk. I don't want that. Okay. But just common shared interests. It's okay right. if the opinions differ. Okay. But as long as the interests are common to a certain level of enthusiasm, I think it's perfect. Okay. So as long as people are generally of the same mindset to you, you really yeah. So, what would you say if I told you, how are you going to know if somebody is of the same mindset as you? You won't. Well, there you go. You already got the answers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you're having a hard time remembering this, when is the last time that you set a bad impression on somebody, and do you remember who it was and what you did? So, I feel like I set a bad impression, and this is recently in my most recent job interview. Okay. I was very anxious and nervous, spoke very quietly, it was kind of stuttery. Okay. And I feel that just set a bad impression. Okay. So. All right. Um, so I have a question. Do you think that in that situation, you could have benefited from using your body language and mental cues to prep yourself for that interaction, that first impression before it happened? Or were you too busy kind of like amping yourself up in anxiety about it? I, it was a little of a self amp, self feedback for, oh no, what okay. if this goes wrong? And it just kind of negative feedback looped up. So, this is a lesson that I learned recently, and I definitely will give credit. It's the art of charm that taught me this. Um, it's called a doorway drill, okay? So, what you should teach yourself, because doorways are a break between spaces, like it's a transition, it's a scene change, it's a whole different area. So, next time that you hit a door frame, and you should make this a practice daily as you walk through doors, give yourself all those sand cues as you walk through a door. So, give yourself the posture cues, Give yourself the mental cues as far as like the, just the general reduction of anxiety. Okay, just kind of focus on that in the background. Keep those skills, and the next time you're in an interview, after you've been practicing this for weeks, you're going to walk through that guy's door, and the first thing that your brain's going to do is it's going to tell you, okay, reset. straighten up, let's go, reset. Yeah. And then you're going to be ready for game time to set that first impression. Even if your conversation breaks down, which hopefully, if you stick around for the lessons that I'm going to teach, it won't. Even if your conversations break down, you at least came in with that solid, confident first impression that's going to stick with it. Okay. And four. You said, like, I don't know. I'm not preaching right <laughs> I just want to help.
So anyway, um, now I want feedback from you guys because there's going to be obviously feedback from the IRC hopefully as well as anybody that watches the YouTube video and stuff like that. Well, that's my first time meeting you. Yeah, I think I've seen you walking around here. But... Also super weird that this is your first time. <laughs> I've only been here a lot of so. times. <laughs> so I've been through a lot of these seminars. Oh my gosh, my vegetable did this a lot. Gotcha. Yeah, this is a, a hell of a first way to meet somebody, but... Uh...